Good morning. What a beautiful crowd we have here today. And look at those beautiful children in the back there. We have four beautiful children in the back today. And that little girl, she's so sweet. Oh, praise the Lord. What a beautiful congregation we have. And we miss our friends who aren't here, but we know that they're somewhere doing what they need to be doing. We we praise the Lord today. I want to just ask you a question. How many of you love the Lord today? Yeah. Amen. Let's, let, let's say it. Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I love you. Amen. See, that way, then when you go home tonight, this afternoon, and somebody asks you, what did you do in church? You can say, well, I told the Lord I love him. <laughs> we, 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 we come to lift up his name and to worship him. And that is so important. And I want you to know that there are those of you who that we've been praying for. Minerva, I've been praying for you. And uh, Maria, I've been praying for you. And we're just praying for all those Harley, Elsie, everyone who needs the Lord's touch. We're holding you up in prayer. And um, uh, Jesus is going to meet those needs. And we just love him today. We, we count on him. We're leaning on the everlasting arms. Amen. And he is good. Jesus is good. Um, uh, just say good morning. I hope you had a wonderful week. Uh, I had a pretty good week. Um, uh, I just praise the Lord. Last week when I was preaching, you know, last week we preached uh, on doubts and unbelief. Doubt, doubt versus unbelief. And uh, we were in John chapter 20 and John chapter 11. And when I was preaching from John chapter 11, the Lord said, this is what you're going to preach next week. Right when I was preaching, I was like, well, do I stop and take notes? Or, or you know, because I have to remember. And my memory is not as good as it used to be. So we're back in John chapter 11 this week. And uh, the name of my sermon is Finding Safe Harbor in the Kingdom of God. And it's really the only place we can find safe harbor. And um, I actually believe I'm going to be in John chapter 11 next week, too, because there's so much truth found in John chapter 11. Um, uh, I want you to know that everybody has needs, we, common needs. We all have certain things that we have to have. We all have to have air. We all have to have food. It's really important that we all have clothes. Um, uh, but we need other things, too. We need to feel loved. Amen? People need to feel loved. Children need to feel loved by their parents. It's so important. And we all have a desire and a need to live in peace. We want to live in peace. We want things to be easy. I don't know if easy and peace go together, but we need it to be peaceful. And I think we all have a need to be and feel safe. We want to feel safe. Amen? You know, um, I believe the best that we can hope for in this world is that we can feel safe most of the time. I feel that the safety we have in this world is a temporary safety. We're really, we, we're really not safe. I mean, we work hard at being safe, so we feel safe, and there is an illusion of safety, but real safety eludes us. The world we live in only appears to be safe because we work so hard to make it safe. It's like the world's policy on nuclear weapons. Anyone knows what that is or what it's called? MAD, Mutually Assured Destruction. That means if Russia, you shoot your missiles at us, we're going to shoot our missiles at you, and we're all going to die together. So you don't want that to happen. So, you know, that's, does that really make you feel safe? <laughs> No, it's not too safe. Um, uh, in fact, there's probably a 50-50 chance that one of these days we'll end up mutually destructive. But people have a need to feel safe. And I think for many of them, feeling safe becomes one of the top priorities that we work at. And some, most of the time, I don't even think we realize how hard we work to be safe. We take out all kinds of insurance, life insurance, house insurance, fire insurance, car insurance, to keep our finances secure and safe, amen? And I'm not saying that insurance is a bad thing. I have insurance. I'm just saying what motivates us to buy it is that need to be safe. We pick neighborhoods to live in where we feel safe. We, we go and we find the safest neighborhood that we can afford to live in, 
And that's not wrong. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm just saying again that it's what motivates us to do that is to feel safe. We arm ourselves. We buy alarm systems. And we try very hard to stay as far away from trouble as we can. Amen? We, we like to stay away from trouble. We see trouble coming, we go the other way. The problem becomes when the desire to feel safe takes too high of a priority in our lives and begins to crowd out some of the impo more important things that we should be doing, amen? Now, and, and I'm gonna explain that to you. This is what I want to talk about today, finding safe harbor in the kingdom of God. And Jesus tells us specifically how to do that how to find safety, how to live in safety. When we'll be in John chapter 11, and John chapter 11 is mostly about the resurrection of Lazarus, and the story is a key book in John. In fact, chapter 11 is the crucial turning point in John, and I think that John is probably the best book in the Bible. I remember when I got saved, uh, my best friend told me, he said, you, you, he gave me a Bible, and he said, you start reading in the book of John. He said, that's the best place to start reading it. And I agree with that. John has a way of bringing the elementary truths of God's kingdom and saying them in a way that we can understand. Amen? Like John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. That's the gospel in one verse. I mean, that's all you need to know. And then you're on your way. This chapter also has some very other, very important truths being revealed in it. We get to see the heart of Jesus in it, and that's probably what I'll preach on next week, and we'll see a little bit of that this week. But at its core, chapter 11, the story of Lazarus is a story about feeling safe, about being safe. Martha and Mary felt safe because they had learned to put their trust in Jesus, and that's always a good ideal, excellent ideal. Lean on the everlasting arms. They knew Jesus loved them, as he loves us, so we can count on the same thing. And they believed Jesus would keep them safe. Amen? I mean, I think that's a reasonable deduction. John chapter 11, verses 1 through 3. Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary, and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. Now, you know, we hear about sick people all the time. And, and, but what they're saying here is, hey, Lazarus is really sick, and, and you need to come. We understand from the text that Lazarus is extremely sick, He's extremely ill because they felt the need to sin for Jesus. And what they're really saying is, Jesus, come quickly. We, we, Lazarus needs you. Even with the sickness, though, we read in their voices, we, we, can, we can read into the language that they were trusting in Jesus, that they believed that Jesus was in control and they felt safe in Jesus. Jesus could handle this, and Jesus would handle it, and Jesus did handle it, right? Amen? We know the story. He raised Lazarus from the dead. That doesn't happen every day. Look, look at the mutual love expressed in verse 2. It says that Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. I don't know of anyone in Scripture, in my opinion, who I think loved Jesus more than Mary. There might have been people who loved Jesus as much as Mary, but from her love that she demonstrated, I believe she loved Jesus more. And I believe that she knew who Jesus was, the Savior of the world, and that he was going to die for her. I think she may have been the only one. But let's go on. Verse 5 tells us explicitly that Jesus loved them too. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, verse 5 says. And Jesus loves us too. I want you to know, Jesus loves you as much as he did Martha, as much as he did Mary, and as much as he loved Lazarus. I think we all feel safe in Jesus because we know that he loves us, and he's promised to help us. Amen? Jesus tells us 
over and over again. As we sung, lean on the everlasting arms. I'll help you. I'll meet your needs. I'll be there for you. I'll keep you safe in the storm. It's not wrong to trust in this love relationship with Jesus. In fact, I believe it's the very best thing we can do. Put your trust in Jesus. But people have come to the place, and I believe people in America, American Christians have come to the place where they believe it's God's job to keep them out of trouble. Amen? I mean, let's be real honest. When we're in trouble, we count on Jesus. And most of the time when we're in trouble, whose fault is it? Is it Jesus' fault or is it our fault? The way most people view their relationship with God today is that they do what they want, and then when they get in trouble, <laughs> well, let's call Jesus into the picture, and he'll take care of it. And he, and he does. He, he's a loving God. He loves you, and there's nothing you can do to keep him from loving you. And yet, this is not what happens in this story here today. In real, it's a real-life story. It really happened. Lazarus dies. Jesus doesn't keep the trouble away. He doesn't keep him safe. And Jesus tells us it's not an oversight. He says, I didn't forget to help. I, didn't, I wasn't too busy to help. I didn't help on purpose, is what he says. He intentionally does not leave in time to save Lazarus. And he's saying, oh, but he loved Lazarus. Well, he, he did love Lazarus. But when, when you deal with Jesus, you have to realize that there are some things more important that he's trying to deal with us in our lives than our safety. Amen? Because for one thing, we will never be safe until we get to heaven. And then we'll be safe for all eternity. I believe the disciples felt safe with Jesus in control. I believe that, I mean, they loved Jesus. They, they trusted him. A little later in the story, we read the disciples, whom I'm sure felt safe with Jesus in control. Verses 6 and 7 say, so, so when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. This is Jesus speaking. Jesus heard that Lazarus was sick, and then he stayed there two more days. And then he said to the disciples, let's go back to Judah. So he stayed there two days. And if we read later in the story, and this isn't going to be on the board, but we find out that when Jesus gets there, Lazarus has been dead for about four days, is what, is, is what it says, around four days. Jesus wanted to make sure Lazarus died because he had some very important spiritual principles that he wanted to teach. And when we hear the story of Lazarus, and I preached the story of Lazarus before, we preach how wonderful Jesus is. He raised Lazarus to the death, from, from, from death. And that is wonderful. Hallelujah. Amen. We serve a Savior who controls death. But Jesus says there's some other things that are just as important here, and I need to make sure you know them. So he waits for two days, and he says, Lazarus needs us. Let's go to Judah. And that was another statement. Lazarus really needed him about then because he had already died. Jesus tells his disciples, let's go to Judah. But he says, what does his disciples say? <laughs> no, Jesus, that's not a good idea. We don't want to go there because when we were there, when we left there, the reason we left there is there were people who were trying to kill you. They didn't like you. They got the stones. They were ready to kill you. And we just barely got away. Jesus, Jesus said, we're, we're going to Judah. Verse 8 says, but Rabbi, they said in a short while ago, the Jews were there trying to stone you, and yet you are going back. <laughs> they couldn't understand that. <laughs> Thomas was the only one that said, okay, let's go with him. I'll, I'll die with him. Remember last week? <laughs> Amen. They don't want to go back there. They, don't, they know the danger. And so they object. They believe that they are safe right where they are, away from trouble. And that's where we live today. We want to stay as far away from trouble as we can. And most of the time, that's a pretty good ideal. <laughs> pretty good ideal. We often think the same way. We, we see the potential for trouble up ahead 
And we want to go in a different direction. Amen? I mean, we, that's, that's what we do. That's what, we're, we're trained. It's, it's in our DNA. You don't run to death. Don't run to trouble. We presume we should stay away, as far away from trouble and criticism and danger and uncomfortableness and all those things as we can. And I'm like that too. We all are like that. In fact, many Christians presume that if trouble's ahead, that God wants them to go in a different direction. It's, it's not even up for discussion. We don't need to pray about that. God would never lead me into harm's way. Amen? God would never lead us into danger. Well, <laughs> actually, God led all of his apostles into danger. He sent them to places where they died, all but one. Here's what we should stop and do as Thomas would do. He'd ask the tough questions. He'd say, he'd say, what about this, Jesus? We can't presume that God always wants us to avoid trouble so we can stay safe at all costs. That is not God's plan for our life. He wants us to be safe. And believe me, he can keep you safe, but he doesn't want us to always run from trouble. That sounds wonderful to be safe all the time, but that promise is not found anywhere in God's scripture. Not the way that we want it to say, Lord, it's up to you to take care of me all the time. And, and we believe that, right? It's true, right? But sometimes Jesus wants to take care of us in the fire or in the lion's den or when Goliath is around or when some of those other things happen in life. Jesus can keep us safe no matter where we go. And that's the point I want to make today. But many of us want to be kept safe from the problems of the world by, our, by the virtue of our connection to God. The, the other people try to stay safe any way they can. But really, as Christians, who we're really trying to stay safe, for God, keep me safe. Jesus uses this opportunity to teach them some very important lessons. And these lessons, I don't know if I've heard them taught very many times, but today we're going to learn them. Jesus finds his safety in the center of God's will. Look at John chapter 11, verses 9 and 10. Jesus answers them, Are there not 12 hours of daylight? Anyone who walks in the daytime will not stumble, for they see the world's light. They see by the world's light. It is when a person walks at night that they stumble, for they have no light. Now, that, that, that's an exceedingly difficult passage to understand in its entirety because Jesus is not teaching one truth here. He's teaching two truths simultaneously. He's saying, here's number one, and here's number two. And number one, first Jesus says, are there not 12 hours of daylight? Now, today we would say, are there not eight hours that we have to work, right? We all go to work for eight hours. But Jesus, in Jesus' day, I guess they had a long day. And he says, are there not 12 hours of daylight? Here he responds to what the apostles had just said, the Jews are out to stone you. Jesus is saying, I have not worked the whole day. I have not worked the whole 12 hours. What he's saying is, I have not completed my mission that God has sent me on. My mission is to save everybody in the world from their sins so that they can have eternal life. And until that mission is done, my work is not complete. And I, nothing can happen to me until I complete that mission. He says, my Father in heaven is able to keep me safe until I complete my mission until he's ready for me to come home. And I want you to know that your Father in heaven can keep you safe until you've completed your mission and he's ready for you to come home. And I want to tell you something. All the doctrine in the world ain't going to keep you from going when Jesus calls your number. Amen? Jesus is saying, I have not worked the whole 12 hours yet. My last hour has not yet come. And the Jews, with all their malice and all their hatred, cannot bring that moment a moment sooner 
than what God has ordained it to be. God's in control of this world. We, a lot of times we get the feeling that the world is starting to get control, that the evil is starting to take over, but that's just the way it feels. God is in control. Jesus says, I'm immortal. Until I finish my mission, until I do what I've come to do, nothing can happen to me. And what I'm going to do in Bethany is part of that mission. It's part of the work God's called me to do. So I don't have to fear going to Bethany, even if the religious leaders are there, even if they want to stone me. I'm safe and secure in the hands of Jesus. Second, he says, anyone who walks in the daytime will not stumble, for they see by the world's light. It is when a person walks at night that they stumble, for they have no light. If you choose to walk in the light of day, you do not need to worry about stumbling, Jesus says. The reference to the world's light is not a negative here. It, it's just an acknowledgement of the physical world we live in. He's making an analogy. He says, he says we walk by the light of day. And when we walk by the light of day, we're all right. And when we walk at night, when there is no light, we stumble and we fall down. And he doesn't say, if we walk at night, he doesn't say, we may fall down. He says, we will stumble. If you walk in the darkness long enough, you will fall, you will stumble. I understand that this statement comes immediately after the disciples' statement of fear. Oh, Jesus, was they're going to stone you. And Jesus says, no, we don't have to worry about that. Let me put it this way. Jesus is saying when you walk with God in the center of his will, there is no safer place to be. Amen? When you're doing what God wants you to do, what God's called you to do, what God's asked you to do, that's as safe as you can ever be. That's safety safe harbor in God's kingdom, amen? That's when you're safe. As long as Jesus is in the center of God's will, Jesus says, I don't have anything to fear. He says, I know when I need to start fearing. I know when the bad time's coming because I know everything. But this isn't it. I haven't worked to the end. I have, the daylight is still out there. We don't have to worry about stumbling because God is our guide. He is safe and secure. He is victorious when he's doing God's will. He doesn't have to worry about the evil in the world because God is in control. We think of safety as a lack of danger, a life without struggle. And, and that's wonderful. I, I love a life without struggle myself. In John 8, 12, when Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but have the light of life. See, that? There's, there's no reference to the world's light here. Jesus has already told them, if, if you follow me, you'll never have to worry about stumbling. You'll have the light that leads to eternal life. What do you do when you enter a dark room? What do you do? You turn on the light, right? Why? Because it makes you feel safe. You know where you're going. You know, at night, I have to get up. The old man, I have to get up. We have a black dog, black German Shepherd. And I'm telling you, that dog, wherever I have to go at night, he's always right in the middle of my path. I, I can't see him. I trip over him all the time. That dog's always in the way. But when you walk with Jesus, even the black dogs can't, can't trip you up. Jesus does not mean the light of day here. Even though the analogy is so spot on, it's hard to get past. You want to walk and live in safety? You walk with Jesus. Amen? That, that's, that's the key. That's what it is. You want to walk in safety? You walk with Jesus. He will keep you safe. If Jesus would have done the safe thing, he wouldn't have, he would have been out of God's will. And he wouldn't have been safe. For most Americans, the road to heaven has become so safe that there is hardly any chance of doing something great for the kingdom of God. I, I, I hate to say that, 
but I believe it's true. We've come to the point where we've, got, we've gotten so comfortable and we've gotten so safe that we never want to step outside that, that little bubble of comfort that Jesus has given us. People say, well, I don't believe in God. Well, you think, well, I wish I could say something, but I don't want that person not to like me. You know what I'm talking about. We, we've gotten to the place where it's more important to be safe and comfortable than to speak out for Jesus. Many Christians have become more interested in saying safe than being in the center of God's will and giving him the glory that he deserves. And I want to tell you something. When you stay in the bubble, you'll never give God all the glory that your life can give him. You understand that? It's not going to happen. You can give, I'm not saying you can't give him glory. You will, but you can't give him all the glory that he designed for your life to bring into this world. You know, we read the old stories in the Bible, and what do they do? They inspire us to live for Jesus. When we think of David and Goliath, it inspires us to live for Jesus. Who's inspiring the people and the children of America today to live for Jesus? We, we have to do that. We can't wait for the world to say, oh, Jesus was right. It'll be too late then. We need to do great things for God. We need to stand up for God now and inspire people to live for Jesus. Amen? We are perfectly content with a minimal impact for the kingdom and a life of tiny fruitlessness if we get to stay safe. And it shouldn't be like that. And I'm not just talking to you. I'm talking about myself, too. I think that's where America's at today. I thank the Lord. Give me this sermon. Right in the middle of preaching last week, and he said, preach this. And I know my people love Jesus. I know you love Jesus. I don't question that you love Jesus. But we've gotten a little too comfortable, haven't we? We, we, we we've gotten to the place where it's easier just not to say anything than to stand up for Jesus sometimes. And if that's not you and you're not that person, forgive me. As long as everybody likes me, as long as no one says bad things about me, as long as they don't think I'm a fanatic for Jesus, as long as we avoid the danger, everything is good. That is not something that we ever see in the life of Jesus or his apostles. He, they, they never lived like that. Jesus was never like that. He was always on his way to the cross. Amen? Our desire should be to do the will of God and to bring him glory. When we do that, we are not guaranteed that we'll be kept away from all struggle and danger. No, we may face some difficulties. We may face some some sacrifices, some may be minor. Most of them will be minor. Who cares what people think about me? Who cares what people say about me? I care what Jesus thinks about me. Some may be major difficulties. Some may be major dangers. Major dangers. I think that kind of rhymes. What we must remember as Christians is death cannot come to us until God has willed it to happen. God is in complete control of life and death, and no one else is. No one else is. There are people who can take your life, but Jesus can give it back. Jesus is in control. Isaiah 54, 17 says, No weapon forged against you will, will prevail, and you will refruit every tongue that ex accuses you. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and this is their vindication from me, declares the Lord. the Lord. God says, if people attack you, I will vindicate you. You will overcome. You will overcome. You will win the battle. This, this is what I promise you. This is it's not something that you do. It's something that I do for you. I ask you, what if Abraham lived as many of God's children live today, in their look, in the little bubble of comfort? He would have never left Haran, 
at age 75 to go to a place where he didn't know where he was going, to land where he didn't know where it was, and we would have never had a father of faith. Amen? <laughs> Who would we have looked up to? We would have never had any, anyone where, Jesus, where God could say, this is what faith looks like. The same is true of Moses. If Moses had played it safe, the children of God would still be in the desert in Egypt. Amen? I mean, God sent him on a dangerous assignment. It wasn't one of those where, you know, go up to Moses and say, we're leaving. We're, we're, we're tired. We've been here 400 years. We're going home. No. It wasn't safe at all. What if David had played it safe? We'd have never had the story of David and Goliath and know that God can give us the victory over every giant in our lives. Amen. What if Peter had played it safe? We would have never known that we could walk on water and do whatever Jesus calls us to do. Now, he's never asked me to walk on water, and I'm not even that good of a swimmer, so that's probably the reason why. But Jesus can give us the victory in any situation that he calls us to. If Jesus calls you to do it, he will equip you to accomplish it. Amen? My point is, the one I want to make is that the place where we find true safety, everlasting safety, and even safety in this world is in the center of God's will. When you're do, right where God wants you to be, doing exactly what God wants you to do, that's as safe as you can ever become. Eternally safe. Safe in the hands of Jesus. And Jesus illustrates that in this story later on, and we'll get to that. As the passage gives us another motivation of why Jesus allowed things to happen the way they did. Jesus, you know, remember, he did this on purpose. He said, you know what? I'm gonna, he didn't say it, but he said, I, I'm staying here two more days. We're going to make sure Lazarus is dead, and then we're going to go back and we're going to do my biggest miracle yet. And not for his glory, but he says for his father's glory. Verse 15, Jesus says, and for your sake, I'm glad that I was not there so that you may believe. Believe what? What did Jesus want them to believe? He wanted them to understand that he was the Christ, the Savior of the world who has power to overcome death. He wanted them to believe that he was the Son of God and that God had sent him into the world. It was vital that they believe that. Why? Because that's the only way to heaven. And that's what Jesus came to do, to save us so that we could go to heaven. Amen? It, it's so important that Jesus taught these troops. <laughs> if you were Lazarus, you probably would have taught another lesson. But it all worked out for him, too. And when we sign on to be Christians, we are saying, Jesus, I will do my part to save others, too. Jesus sent his disciples out into the world, Matthew 10, 7. He says, as you go, proclaim the message. The kingdom of heaven has come near you. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons, and this is our part. Freely you have received, freely give. What, what did we receive freely? The gospel of Jesus Christ. Salvation story. You got it for free, and then you pass it on to others freely. Not just the people you like or love, but even the people you dislike. Even people you hate, Jesus wants you to pass on the gospel message. Scripture reveals another reason. In verse 4, Jesus says, the point of this whole thing is for my Father's glory. This fits into what, the world, the, what we just talked about, what the disciples were saying in verse 15. <laughs> They're going to kill you, Jesus. Jesus says, he tells us, he demonstrates in this story Allowing Lazarus to die creates a situation where the power of God can flow through Jesus Christ and it will become evident to all and will bring his father much glory. He says when people see this, they're going to see my father. They're going to see his power. They're going to see what he can do, that he's in control of death and life. 
let us understand how dangerous this was for Jesus. I want you to know that this wasn't just another miracle that Jesus did. This brought danger into Jesus' life. How do I know that? Look at First John chapter 11, verse 53. It says, it tells us that after Jesus did this miracle, that from that day on, they plotted to take his life. Whose life? Jesus' life. They said, we can't have this guy go around doing all this stuff. We've got to get rid of him. We're going to lose all of our power. We're going to lose all of our control. He's going to be the head. And we're going to lose out. We've got to get rid of him. And we all know how that ended. They did get rid of him for a little bit. Jesus' goal is not safety, but the glory of God. Jesus endured great suffering to purchase our salvation. He, he paid the ultimate price, the highest price that could ever be paid. It did not, he did not stay on the path of safety. In fact, his path was defined by struggle and danger. But on that path of struggle and danger, Jesus was completely safe in the hands of God. Amen? And while we're on the path of struggle and danger, we're completely safe in the hands of our Father. Amen? Nothing can happen to you until God says, it's time. And then nothing can save you. You're on your way to heaven. Praise the Lord. This, this just yesterday, we got a message from our church in Hobbs. One of our old saints passed away. And then last night from our church in Harlingen, one of our old saints passed away. One of them was on vacation. Passed away on vacation. Can you imagine? They got to get him back. I mean, that's a vacation that they'll remember for all the wrong reasons. But the point is, is that when it's your time to go, you're going. And until then, nothing the world does to you is final. Amen? Nothing the world does to you is final. There, people can come and kill you, but that's not final. Jesus says that's not final. And that's what he said in, in Lazarus' life. Acts 2.24, Jesus was completely safe as long as he was doing God's will. The, the Pharisees said, we're, we're going to kill him. They killed him. The Romans, the Pharisees, all the, Satan, they all believed they had shut Jesus up. No, we did it. We took care of him. He's done. No. Death didn't have the final word in Jesus' life. And death doesn't have the final word in our lives. It never does. If you follow in God's light, if you follow and walk in the light of Jesus, death never has the final word. It's never final. John 11, 4 says, when he heard about Lazarus, he said, this, will, this sickness will not end in death. Now, of course, we know that Jesus didn't mean that Lazarus wouldn't die. What he meant was is that death doesn't have the final word. It, it may seem like it's final, but it's not. Jesus is in control. Jesus calls the shots. This is true of all Christians about any sickness, any problems we face. I don't care what your problem is. Jesus has the answer. Someone asks you a question, I tell people all the time, you ask me anything, I know all the answers. And when they ask me, I say, well, Jesus knows. Jesus is the answer. Jesus is the answer to your problem. When you die as a Christian, death is not the final word. Through the power of the resurrection of Jesus, no sickness, no problem we face will ever ultimately end in death. Amen? That's exactly what Jesus said about Lazarus. He said, this is not going to end in death. And he was already dead. Even if the cancer kills us, that is not the end of the story. We will not end up silent in a grave. No, through Jesus, the story will not end there. It never ends there. The grave is not the final place for a man or a woman who loves Jesus Christ. When you walk in the light of Christ, death never has the final word. Jesus always has the final word. Always 
Always, always. Jesus Christ is the light of the world. He's the only safe harbor you will ever find in this world of darkness. Jesus said that we live in a dark world and that he came. He's the light of the world. And when we walk by his light, we'll never stumble, but we'll have the light of life. Jesus is in control. Amen? Completely in control. You don't have to worry. You don't have to. I'm not saying don't lock your doors or don't turn on the alarm or don't put the big dog out or do those things. Those are just things that we can do. But trust in Jesus. Trust in Jesus. When Jesus said that we have 12 hours of light, he told the disciples, he said, we only have so much time that we can work. And then the darkness will come, and the time to work will be over. And that meant more than just in Jesus' life. When the darkness comes for us, when death comes for us, our time to believe and our time to work will be over. It'll be too late. We have to believe now. Jesus said in John 12, 36, put your trust in the light while you have it so that, it may be, so that you may become the sons of light. Amen? Nothing is more important than your relationship with God. It's not, some, it's not an insurance policy. It's a relationship. We love Jesus. We walk with Jesus. We do Jesus' will, not because we have to, but because we choose to, amen? We choose to follow Jesus. It's not something that we have to do. There's a whole world out there that's not doing it. We do it because we love him. And the reason we love him is because we see what he did for us. He died in our place for our sins so that we could be the children of God, the children of light. Jesus so desperately wants to have relationship with the world, not just with us. He wants us, but he wants the world too. And he says we only have so many hours that we can work. And I'm closing here, but what I want to say is, is when you compare your safety to the hours that you have left to work, which is really the most important? When you know that nothing can happen into, to you until Jesus allows it to. Amen? You know, there's a whole world out there that if you stand up for Jesus, they'll attack you. They, they, they don't want you to stand up for Jesus. They don't want you to love Jesus. But we should love Jesus anyway. We shouldn't worry about what the world thinks. If you want to do something great, for Jesus, you want to do something great for God, just trust in him and, and stand on his word. You don't have to go out of your way to find people to witness to. They'll find you. Just stand on the word. And when people ask you why you do what you do, you tell them it's because of Jesus. I am the person that I am because Jesus made me this way. He recreated me into a son of God. And now I love him and I do things his way. And when you do that, you don't ever have to worry about stumbling in the darkness. You don't ever have to worry about falling. You don't have to worry about death. You don't have to worry when the doctor says, well, you know, I don't even know how to say this, but I've been doing this for 30 years and I've never gotten it right, but you got cancer. You don't have to worry when the doctor says that. It's, you don't have to rejoice either, but you don't have to worry. Jesus has the final word, amen? I've known a lot of people that were told they had cancer, and there's some, a lot of them are still alive. My old pastor in Hobbs was one of them. Say, hello, pastor, I'm sorry. Don't look like you're going to make it. Pastor said, you know what? Where I come from, God has the last word. I'm going to trust in him. We want to trust in Jesus. Amen? Amen. When, if you put your trust in Jesus, you'll be right where you need to be. You'll, you'll be right in the center of his will. In the center of his hands. No one 
can take you out of the hands of God. You are perfectly safe in the hands of Jesus. Amen? Let's close in prayer. I hope, I hope you have a wonderful week. I hope God blesses you. Dear Heavenly Father, we, we love you today, Lord. We praise you. We, we've sung praises to you. We've read your word. We've, we've, we've expounded on your word. We, we, we love you, Lord. We thank you especially for all the blessings you give us for our children and our wives and our husbands and our families, Lord, and the food we have and the jobs, everything that you've blessed us with, Lord. But more than anything else, Lord, we praise you for what you did on Calvary, that you died for us so that we might have eternal life, that death doesn't have the final word over our lives anymore. Death used to rule over us, but now Jesus you're king. You're my king. You rule us. We praise you, Lord, for what you've done. We pray, Lord, that as we leave this place that you go with us and that you would help us, Lord, to not always think that we have to pursue the safest road, but help us, Lord, to pursue the road that brings you the most glory, even if it looks dangerous. May the God of all hope fill you with joy and peace in believing so that you will abound in all the power of the Holy Spirit and be able to do all that God calls you to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless each and every one of you.